Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Riker. I'm Director of Climate Change and Energy Initiatives at, at Google.org. And welcome and happy Earth Day. Of course, when I said that to my wife this morning, she looked at me like I was really losing it. Her birthday was two months ago, kind of confused in what I said. I'd also like to welcome you to the next in our series of Green at Google Talks. The goal of the series is to bring to Google professors, authors, and thought leaders to discuss issues related to energy and the environment. And we have a very prominent one today, uh, Vinod Kosla. Before I introduce Vinod, I'd like to give you a few opening thoughts. So let me ask a question. What year was the first Earth Day? Good. Some of you, many of you, were not even born. I, I was a young kid on that day in 1970, but I got to lead our school's Earth Day celebration, and I call this the fifth most important day of my life after my wedding and the birth of our three kids. On that first Earth Day, we picked up trash from the school grounds and piled it on the stage for a school assembly, and we planted a tree. An innocent start for the environmental movement when the problems are often local and the solutions usually straightforward. Put a filter on a smokestack, pick up some litter, plant a tree. Fast forward to today, our planet is clearly in peril and the solutions are highly complex, both technically and politically. The good news is the rising consensus about the need to act and to act fast and the improving tools that we have to respond. Today in DC, there is an extraordinary hearing on an unprecedented piece of legislation, 648 pages in length, that would launch a comprehensive response to our climate and energy crisis. I get to testify on it tomorrow. Today in Iowa, President Obama is visiting an old washing machine factory that now makes wind turbine parts. Talk about agitating for change. And today in California, sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Bill, you know me too well. And today in California on Earth Day, we are pleased to be joined by a good friend and a real leader in finding and financing the solutions to the climate crisis. Vinod Kosla was a co-founder of Daisy Systems and founding chief executive office, officer of Sun Microsystems, where he pioneered open systems and commercial risk processors. Sun was funded by Kleiner Perkins, and in 1986, Vinod switched sides and joined Kleiner. 2004, he formed Coastal Ventures, driven by the need for flexibility and a desire to be more experimental, to fund sometimes imprudent science experiments, and to take on both for-profit and for social impact ventures. Coastal Ventures focuses on both traditional venture capital technology and clean technology ventures. Social ventures include affordable housing, microfinance, among others. He holds a Bachelor of Technology in Electrical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, a Master's in Biomedical Engineering from Carnegie Mellon, and an MBA from Stanford. It is my great pleasure to introduce Vinod Kosla. Good morning or afternoon, happy Earth Day. What, uh, what I'm going to try and do is talk about a wide range of issues. Uh, both the traditional view, how it's formed, why it's wrong, why the environmental view is often wrong, uh, and all the things um, that people are doing. My goal is really to have you walk away with the right set of questions to ask whenever you run into things. And the right question uh, should lead to the answer, is this material, whatever this is. Um, let me start with all the naysayers who essentially say change doesn't happen, and who can't see past their noses when it comes to vision. So I'm a religious subscriber to this view that all change depends on unreasonable people. Um, also, we have a climate crisis, we have an energy crisis, we have a security crisis, we have a terrorism crisis. All those crises would be a terrible thing to waste. Uh, uh, it, it gives us the opportunity to actually affect a change. So let me talk about very quickly some of the some of the really 
short-sighted things we've seen in the past. This was from Western Union who couldn't see the value of a telephone. Or, oops, uh, my favorite, uh, thankfully, digital equipment thought there was no need for a computer in every home. He didn't think about 100 computers in every home. Um, uh, of course, the president of the Royal Society thought that heavier-than-air flying machines were impossible. This, this is one of my favorites in 1899. I wish he was alive today. But this is the view that we take in renewable energy mostly. And then in come the pundits. And they make all these forecasts. You've all seen these energy forecasts to 2030, 2050, even the year 2100. Trying to forecast 2030 just 20 years hence, given the current range of change, and one of you is smart enough to do the math, will imply the amount of change, maybe more change than happened in the last 100. To see what 2030 might be like, you might need to go back to 1910 to look at the delta. I suggest, given the accelerating rate of technology development, somebody do that exercise. These forecasters fundamentally forget what precision they can do their calculations with. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, they're, they're sort of fun. I think uh, we figured this out a long time ago, or some people did. They didn't. This is oil price forecasts uh, every five years. The forecast in 1985 was $34 a barrel five years out in 1990. The actual was 25, just about a 30% error, only five years out. The 10-year forecast in 1985. 1990, five years, 10 years, 95. So you sort of see uh, this is the five-year out forecast in the year 2000, actual versus forecast. The 10 year out forecast, we won't know till next year what the actual oil price is. Uh, and my bet is even today, people can't guess whether it'll be $35 or $135. Uh, somebody at British Petroleum told me they'd had trouble figuring out the sign of the change, let alone the magnitude of the change. Um, if you thought that was just oil, gas price forecasts, you'd think uh, done the same thing. You'd think uh, uh, coal would be more predictable. Coal has been equally unpredictable. This is my favorite forecast. So I said, why are these forecasts so long, wrong? McKinsey was bold enough in 1980 to make a 20 year out forecast for the number of cell phones in the US in the year 2000. Nice, impressive number, uh, less than uh, a million phones. Sounded like good growth. AT&T decided to divest the cell phone business in the early 80s based on uh, this expensive study they'd paid for. There were 109 million phones. Um, and so I looked into why. Why were they so wrong? This was the phone in 1980. There probably would be 900,000 cell phones only if this was the cell phone. <laughs> this was the phone in 1980, smaller than the handset cord. And many people don't remember, cell phones had handset cords in 1980. And so when you use yesterday's technology to make tomorrow's forecast, you are bound to get the kind of errors. Unfortunately, whether Dan's testifying tomorrow or the Congressional Budget Office, they will use these forecasts to predict what can actually happen. There is no other way. I won't spend time on it. Uh, two, big, two big things worth pointing out. They have low standard deviation for those of you statistically inclined and uh, large standard errors. That's what's going on in these forecasts. Um, there's another element. Most of them are biased almost completely by what people's 
belief system is. Last year, there was this food price controversy on what percentage of the, bio, uh, of the food price change was caused by biofuels. Two entities, credible entities, the World Bank and the U US Department of Agriculture, using very similar models, came up with dramatically different results. Partly, I think each was trying to prove their point, but there was two or three assumptions that had nothing to do with the model that they made different. The single but largest piece of that variance, the difference, um, was their assumption around whether to assign the speculation in food prices to biofuels or to other commodities. So if you subtracted out the speculation in all other commodities, like copper, for example, and said, that the USDA said that's happening in all the commodities independent of whether they're tied to biofuels. The World Bank decided they'd ascribe that to biofuels. So in fact, hidden in the assumptions is all you need to doctor the end results to whatever you want them to be. And that's the kind of nonsense that goes on. So we have a choice. We can extrapolate the past. You've seen how reliable that is. Or we can invent the future, to quote uh, Steele from Alan Kay. Um, I like Alan Kay's method. We can, in fact, in invent the future. Now, almost everybody in the Western world thought swans were white. And for ages, people thought swans were white. Till somebody went down to Australia and found a black swan that redefined the definition of, of swans. This is the thesis of a book, uh, a series of books by Nassim Taleb. I'd highly recommend reading it because I think buried in there is the solution to the energy crisis. It is entirely based on what I call the black swan theory. Rare events of extreme impact and only retrospective predictability. The financial crisis was a black swan. In fact, Nassim was a hedge fund trader. He had essentially forecast it. Um, nobody paid attention. Now, every pundit can explain exactly why we have a crisis. Of course it was obvious after it happened. Monday morning quarterbacking is easy. That's what black swans are. And technology shocks are perfect black swans. The financial crisis was a negative black swan. Technology shocks can be positive black swans. And what we need is more at-bats, more shots and go. If we try more things, we will have a greater probability of succeeding. That's the single biggest thing we can do. So let me imagine a number of what-ifs. Think of them as black swans. Radical things do happen. If, what if the best way to clean up the air was to build more coal power plants? And as I, you'll hear from me in just a moment, uh, there's only four problems, coal, oil, steel, and cement. Uh, what if carbon, cement was carbon negative? Today we produce two and a half billion tons of cement, many times that of concrete, by heating bulk material to 1600 degrees C, centigrade. That's really hot, and really hot means lots of energy. It's almost ridiculous we could take that much material and heat it to that temperature just to make cement. Well, the Stanford professor came to me, said carbon sequestration, everybody's working on CCS, capture the carbon. Now, when you look at a gas like that, the thermodynamics of taking carbon dioxide molecules out of that mix just don't sound very energy efficient to me especially if you're doing it at 50,000 coal plants across billions of tons of gaseous material. We would, then you sort of separate it, pressurize it, transport it hundreds if not thousands of miles in high pressure pipelines. That sounds really expensive, really energy intensive. Most estimates say you'd up, eat up more than 30% of the capacity of a coal plant just doing the sequestra sequestration. And then you hope it stays there for 50 years, or 100 years, or 500 years. Uh, uh, 
this person said to me, I'd like to use carbon dioxide, which is CO2, as a feedstock to make CO3. The largest store of carbon dioxide may, in fact, I haven't done the calculation, be calcium carbonate, limestone. So he wants to make building materials out of this. And as ridiculous as that sounds, in the very first meeting I said, this is a great uh, shot on goal. Let's take it. We guessed there was probably a 90% chance it wouldn't work. Today I would say there's a 90% chance it will work. I still don't know whether it will work for sure or not. I won't claim it does. Um, another black swan. What if more driving meant less carbon? If you use the right feedstock, you can, in fact, sequester. When plants produce carbon dioxide, uh, capture carbon dioxide, they put it in the plant, but they also put it in the soil. With the right agronomic practices, in fact, you can see soil carbon increasing while you're harvesting carbon dioxide from the air through plants. And so this, um, and it sounds ridiculous, a million year crude production cycle. In fact, this um, a scientist, an old Exxon scientist called me and said everything I was doing in ethanol was wrong. And my immediate answer was, well, tell me what, why and what, what's better. And he laid out this picture for me and he said, keep in mind, all crude oil comes from biomass in millions of years. Um, uh, it just takes millions of years. If I can do it in hours or minutes, then we got the perfect biofuel. Didn't take me very long to do, take that shot on goal. His chemistry was very simple. Hydrocarbons are hydrogen carbon. Biomass is hydrogen carbon and oxygen. So all I got to do is remove the oxygen. And I think I have the right catalyst to do that within minutes since the millions of years. Different shot on goal. There was another guy who came to me who said, I can cut the fuel consumption of existing engines by half. A very simple idea. He was not going to change the engines. He was only going to change the fuel injector. And the key is not to inject fuel into the cylinder. You get fuel into your fuel injector. What you inject into your cylinder is supercritical fluid. I won't go into the technical details, uh, but you can more than double the efficiency of combustion. This is looking pretty good. Just by changing fuel injections, cut world oil consumption in half. Uh, I'm trying to get you a sense of black swans, batteries. Almost certainly um, lithium ion batteries won't make it and make for scalable electric cars. I'll come back to this issue. So one of my highest priorities is to find a battery black swan. It's probably the only battery worth working on if you're looking at transportation. And by the way, it's the only thing we need to also make wind and solar real. So there's two different types of batteries, one for automotive use. They're probably not lithium ion chemistry for either one. Uh, it may be something like floor cells for wind and solar. It may be a battery for cars. Don't know yet but we're looking for those black swan ideas, along with plenty of other black swans. So we're looking for relevant scale solutions for oil and coal. So when that entrepreneur comes to me and says, I can use restaurant grease from San Francisco and turn it into biodiesel, neat idea, immaterial at any relevant scale. And there's hundreds, if not thousands, of these neat ideas that people are doing that don't matter. Unfortunately, many politicians can't tell the difference. There are only four carbon problems on the planet. Oil, coal, cement, and steel. Of course, efficiency will let us use less oil or less coal or less electricity. So it's a really important piece. If we solve those four problems, we're done with climate change. If we don't solve them, we can solve all the other problems and we are not done with climate change. So let's not focus on the thousand things that don't matter. Let's focus on the things that matter. 
So I'm going to spend uh, some time um, um, talking about how do we evaluate solutions? What's important? Of course, relevant cost, relevant scale, relevant adoption. What do I mean by this? And there's a few other criteria I'll get into. There's only one test for a renewable for me. Does it meet the Chindia price? The price at which it would be adapted in India and China without subsidies, voluntarily against fossil fuels. That's where the growth is, all the carbon emissions are. That's where most of the world's consumption is going to be. If it doesn't be pass this unsubsidized market competitiveness test within five to seven years, it is not going to be a material solution. Very simple. The scaling model, you know, the oil companies have this model of building refined, centralized large refineries. If one company that has a black swan technology has to replicate that, it won't work. The internet has taught us, computing has taught us, that distributed exponential models of scaling are what's important. Again, I won't go into it too much, but it's really important to look at the scaling models for these technologies. So here's some key criteria, and I'll talk about them very, very quickly. Unless a technology meets at least the first four criteria, it's not going to be material, it's not going to be relevant. Somebody will say, oh, neat, you're doing the green stuff. You look popular, maybe you'll drive a Prius, but it doesn't matter. So cost and carbon trajectory. That's the typical blue line trajectory of a technolo new technology. There's a fossil fuel cost. I've assumed it to be constant. It's not constant, generally. And this is the time period when, with, during which they need subsidy or support. But how do you tell it from a technology, and hydrogen fuel cells probably falls in that list, where it, it, it will never get down to be competitive. That's one of the hardest decisions I make. Which one will scale in cost? Has the right cost trajectory in which one won't? And it's surprising. If you have a carbon price, we just have a lower bar to meet or a higher bar because the cost of fossil plus the cost of carbon is the new metric the new technology has to meet. This is the only thing carbon price does. We see lots of cost curves like this, declining cost curves. People forget they're much more complex than that. Technologies don't all scale. You might see a technology like solar decline. Different technologies like wind may start lower but decline less. And coal is actually increasing in cost. Now, it's worth looking at the details behind these. What is the cost trajectory with scale? Does it have declining cost with scale? I'm actually worried that people are banking on wind. Wind uh, has two problems. One, it does not have declining cost with scale because the single biggest component of wind cost is the real estate site. And guess what? The best sites are used up first. So with the possible exception of offshore wind, which may be a lot more scalable, I don't know yet, uh, we do have this issue. But it's more complex than that. And so my first message is trajectory matters, and it's almost never considered. There's also, those of you in the semiconductor business understand that each generation of silicon has a declining cost. And then new generations can come along, start a new declining curve, a lot lower. Silicon can, uh, photovoltaics can do the same thing. Crystalline silicon, amorphous silicon, thin film cell silicon, multi-junction thin film silicon. Yep. But is this enough? When people talk about module costs, it's not because that may be the technology cost. There's the cost of inputs, feedstock or land. In the case of solar, land costs staying pretty constant. In the case of wind, they are increasing because the best sites are taken up first. Of course, the last piece is construction cost. And that is almost always increasing. So your total cost, whether it's increasing or declining, depends on the combination and the relative proportion of these three costs. 
an analysis you seldom see. Uh, so it's important to get behind the numbers. Carbon trajectory. If you did, if you used a solar cell 20 years ago, almost certainly over the life of the solar cell, it did not produce enough electricity to make up for the electricity required to produce the solar cell 20 years ago. Short lives, low efficiencies, lots of energy intensity in producing the cell. So we have to realize that early on, technologies have high carbon emissions. So you have to say, what's their curve? And if our goal is to be 80% below fossil technologies, which is what most scientists agree is a reasonable goal by 2050, then that's the trajectory we should pick. Two Boone Pickens recently suggested we go with natural gas. We would get a very nice initial decline in carbon, probably 20%. But I don't think after that there's much improvement. You get everything and it has a poor carbon trajectory. So important to consider that. Scalability I've talked about in the interest of time. I won't spend too much, but to give you a sense of scale, that's all the land that would be required to produce the world's electricity. And if that was a 3,000 kilometer transmission grid arrow, you could get to most parts of the world with solar electricity, with just a transmission grid, not a hard technology. Scalability is important to consider. This is a problem with geothermal. It can be exciting, but irrelevant. So the only area we're doing in geothermal is engineered geothermal, and I know it's a high priority for Google too. But looking at some radical things, this is all the land that would be needed to produce electricity in the United States. All of US electricity from a small, car, probably a disposable county in Nevada. <laughs> so, I know, I'm all, I've already got 30 emails uh, criticizing me for, for that comment on, the, on my email. I always get that. Uh, let's talk about adoption risk. People love electric cars. So I looked at the passenger miles likely to be driven in this car, the $2,500 Nano, against the passenger miles driven in the Honda Civic Hybrid, not, not a high-end car, in India, the cars just, both cars just being introduced. The passenger miles in the Honda Civic Hybrid are irrelevant because the volume of this car is going to be so much higher. That's the critical analysis we have to do when we are talking about things like electric cars. It's why I think the only relevant technology is a black swan of batteries if you're going to go with electricity. Almost certainly, unless we can change the assumptions, it will be an internal combustion engine. So doubling the efficiency of an internal combustion engine would be a great thing to do, and it's probably not that hard. We had three efforts to do the same thing, three separate engine efforts to improve efficiency. There's another issue with adoption risk. So uh, I should point out, with this car, if you added $10,000 worth of batteries, something people hope to get to someday with lithium ion, you're not going to get adoption. The flip side of adoption, these are all the paper mills in the US going out of business. Each could be a biofuels plant. It's why I'm focused on biofuels. And if you could produce a crude oil that, the, that Exxon would say, I'll happily buy crude oil from you instead of buying not from Hugo Chavez, that's an easy sell. And it's an easy sell to the people each of those dots probably represents somewhere between 300 to 1,000 jobs that are no more are going out uh, of business. So adoption risk is absolutely key. Optionality is also key. If I look at biofuels, on the left, in, in orange, yellow, is all the feedstocks. As you go down the page, you have increasing volume and decreasing cost. That's where you want to be. You want to stay away from food-based biofuels for lots of reasons, 
but they definitely don't make the economic. In blue is all the technology, so we have lots of options. I just gave you one example of a black swan, which is a thermochemical conversion of biomass to crude oil. And then, of course, lots of different fuels are possible, which are in green. That optionality increases the probability of success. But then uh, what about hybrids or electric cars? I'm not counting them on out. As, you, as I said, black swans or batteries, one of my highest priorities. But let's look at this graph. If on the left-hand axis is percentage of power or passenger miles driven on a liquid fuel, and on the right is percentage of power from electric sources, this is a great competition to set up. If batteries develop slowly, then you'll see this yellow line, and battery percentage of passenger miles will increase slowly, and most of it will be liquid fuels. If, on the other hand, batteries develop rapidly, and I find that black swan, battery percentage will go up rapidly, and fuels will go slowly. This kind of optionality is really valuable for society. It's a competition between the biofuel technologies and the battery technologies, and let's have at it. If we can add two more other alternatives, great. Capital formation. Unless people make money, things don't scale. So again, lots of things important to capital formation. Short innovation cycles. Nuclear innovation cycles are 20 years. You think of a brilliant new idea for a nuclear power plant, it will not be in production for 15 or 20 years. Very long innovation cycle. You want short innovation cycles, short investor return cycles, and of course, eventually unsubsidized market competition. That's how you get scalability. That's how you tell investors, I can address India and China's markets, which are the fastest growing, and make money without needing subsidies or regulation. Um, so this is a, a second topic that's particularly important. Um, excuse me just a second. Grab some water. This is really important to climate change negotiations, and I think we're doing them the wrong way. Let me explain this chart. In, blue, in light blue is world GDP growth. If the world grows at 3%, and I don't think anybody in the world is going to sacrifice economic growth, and in the red line, is what scientists tell us we need to do with carbon emissions by 2050. The math between those two numbers, world GDP growth and in light blue, and carbon emissions in red, make it very clear that carbon productivity, the amount of carbon emissions per dollar of GDP, has to increase, improve. Carbon productivity or carbon efficiency of the economy has to go up by 5.6% a year. It's simple math. If you give me GDP growth and my carbon emissions target by 2050, this is just math. This is really important to understand. And we can follow that curve, or we can follow a curve like this. I think wrongly, too many environmentalists are focused on carbon reduction. It is the wrong thing to do. It's saying swim as fast as you can, even if you're not going to get to the other side of this stream. Or if you're fighting a current that's so strong, you're never going to make it. Keep swimming. Not a very smart thing to do. There's an example of this. In the human genome sequencing project, there was one project started by the US government, long-term project to sequence the human genome. Craig Venner started years later, decided not to work on sequencing the human genome. He started to work on the tools for human genome sequencing. He built capacity for sequencing he didn't sequence. Once he had the right technology for sequencing, he caught up and beat the big government-sponsored project. I am suggesting 
that we don't need to reduce carbon as much. Obviously, it'd be nice if we do. What we need to focus on is building capacity for carbon sequestration and, and carbon reduction and efficiency improvements. And what that means is technology. So um, this is another way to explain it. If, if we are in 2008 or 2009 now, and we said this is all our capital stock in the world, and it declines on average, depreciates over 30 years or so. Over 30 some years, the blue will be the depreciation in the capital stock. If we start equipping our buildings with energy efficiency, retrofits, we will make the improvement in the yellow lines because most of the capital stock, and this includes buildings, it includes factories, it includes every, everything. Right? Uh, and that's why the long depreciation cycle. In red will be the new capital plant we build because of new GDP growth in the planet at 3% a year. Now, would you rather work on the yellow or the red and the blue combined? Because the blue will have to be replaced. Carbon reduction capacity building is absolutely key to solving this problem, almost never considered. Oops. So the goal is very clear. And I'm going to run out of time, so I'll move a little more quickly. It's cost, it's carbon reduction capacity, it's carbon and scaling trajectory, it is capital formation, it's low adoption risk, and it's maximum optionality for society. But then we got the environmentalists who I have started to have a lot of beef with. Shell is my favorite. Use one sheet of toilet paper instead of two. I'm sorry if the whole world switched to using one sheet of toilet paper instead of two, it wouldn't make a difference in climate change. Of course, there's marketing. My favorite is eco bikinis. Just make them smaller. Uh, <laughs> this was from Australia. Uh, kangaroos fought less, have less methane emissions. So we should switch to kangaroo meat instead of cattle meat. This was from The Guardian in the UK, advice to soccer fans not to fly their flags out of their cars. Sorry, it's not going to change climate change. My favorite is sustainable tar sands from Shell. Great marketing campaigns. I hope I don't have to explain that. And of course, great books about 100 easy ways to be green, the lazy environmentalist. Uh, it's, this is probably an English major who couldn't get a job, so decided to write a book. There are no easy ways. This is about real fundamental transformation of society. This was a favorite project on hydrogen in uh, Oakland. Three years of actual experimental data. Their diesel buses cost $1.61 a mile to run. After three years, their zero emission hydrogen fuel cell buses cost $51 a mile to run. They're already in the red. I wonder what would happen if they switched all their cars to this. Only politicians, only with other people's money. San Francisco, Moscone Center, photovoltaics, good idea or bad? Terrible idea. He should have put it in Mojave. Maybe it appeals to his political ambitions to put it uh, in San Francisco. But in fact, it's a foggy city. If he had any economic sense, the least he would have done is rented the roof of the San Jose Convention Center. <laughs> I've talked about wind, so what I would say, if wind is going to be scalable in a massive way, storage of wind is key. And there's lots of clever ways to do it other than using batteries. Zero emission buildings, another bad environmental fad. Why? Because you break up energy generation, you're going to get uneconomic scale. Now that may change. A black swan may come along, and I hope it's right, and we're experimenting with building a building that's zero energy. But it's not what legislation should be pushing. It's what scientists should be working on. Palm oil, another bad idea. Food-based fuels just don't scale. 
And not because, you know, you can argue about f using food to feed SUVs. I won't get into that argument. I actually think that's a little bit of a false argument. But there's another raised reason food-based fuels don't make any sense at all. Food-based crops will not get to more than, pick a number, 10,000 miles driven per acre per year. That's the metric I use. Biomass non-food crops can get us to 50,000 miles, maybe 100,000 miles driven per acre per year. Then the land use argument goes away. In fact, I would argue, and for those of you interested, there's a paper on my website called Where Will Biomass Come From? I would argue that a lot of the degraded land, agricultural land that can no longer be used in agriculture, can be restored to its original health with the right agronomic, agronomic practices. So, does a Prius make sense? I suspect a lot of you drive a Prius or something similar. I do drive a hybrid, so I'll criticize myself. The single most expensive way to reduce carbon. If you compute the cost per ton of carbon taken out. McKinsey did a study recently and highly recommend it. And IEA did a similar study. Over $100 a ton of carbon for carbon reduction. It's the wrong economic solution. Uh, Art Rosenfeld out of Lawrence Berkeley Labs and also Energy, California Energy Commission just wrote a paper painting a thousand square feet of your roof white. So if you just painted your average roof white, you'd save more carbon dioxide than buying a Prius and you could save the extra five grand or you could plant a few trees and do the same thing. And if you have electric cars worldwide, it's magically, this is what you'd be doing. They'd be coal powered. That is going to be most of the world's electricity the next 20, 30 years. So what if you powered them with renewable electricity? Stacking one risky transformation to electric cars on top of another risky transformation, the more you cascade the risk, the higher the probability of failure. Save water. Shut off the tap when you brush your teeth. Take a shorter shower. These are European numbers. Average person, North America, 100 to 150 liters of water. Growing one kilogram of wheat, 1,000 liters. One kilogram of beef, 15,000. So it's not your shower that matters. If you want to save carbon, become a vegetarian. We have to do real numbers, real analysis, not feel good stuff is my message. There's the other side. Exxon's too rational. This New York Times uh, article last year had a subheading called Green is for Sissies. This is the other extreme from the environmentalists. I'm happy to criticize everybody, uh, including myself. <laughs> uh, they practice discipline, patience, vision, and that doesn't equal green is basically what the article said. So you have the three classes, no change bigotry, environmental everything, and then I hope I'm a pragmatist, not an environmentalist. And so my view, back to Exxon, is Exxon is more right than wrong. Because unless you have disciplined business investment, rates of return, large markets, IRRs, investors won't put up the money unless you reach unsubsidized market competitiveness. So I think Exxon is more right than wrong. The only place I believe they're wrong is in forecasting the future of technology, and that's where we'll surprise them. Because technology expands the art of the possible, and today's unimaginable becomes tomorrow's conventional wisdom. Almost as certainly as in 1985, we couldn't imagine everybody, even grandma, using a computer. Almost as certainly as in, even in 1990, most people imagined they'd never use email. My business school classmates laughed at me because I had my email address on my business card, which was pretty nerdy. And 
almost as certainly as most people wouldn't imagine using the net in 1995 when Netscape wasn't quite, or a browser wasn't a common term. Almost as certainly in most parts of the world in the year 2000, most people didn't think cell phones would replace landlines. And almost as certainly as in 2005, they couldn't imagine Citibank could go under, or Morgan Stanley could go under. Almost as certainly, we will see this new change in 2010, in 2015, in 2020. This is another one of my favorite charts, number of, number of connections in the city of London, 90 to 99, except it's not the number of internet connections. It is the number of electric connections in the city of London, and the date is 1890 to 1899. And guess what was the normal response at the most, hopefully the most enlightened place on earth, Yale. People thought there was too much light. That is human behavior that we will deal with, the denial we will believe with, and sort of staying with the comfortable that we will have to deal with. We also dealt with bubbles. In yellow is the Morgan Stanley High Tech Index. We all know the dot-com bubble in 2001. Was it real? Stock prices went up, stock prices went down, and then started to go back up. But I claim there was no bubble. In red is internet traffic. I was asked in 2001 what my forecast was for the internet after this collapse for 2010, and I said no different. Because real life is about real use, not about stock prices. There was no bubble in, inter oops, no bubble in internet usage, as you can see with the red line. Can you tell where the bubble was? So we get distorted by Wall Street perceptions of reality. We think that's reality. It's not. Bubbles happen all the time. Almost the same dot-com bubble happened with railroads. Now, if you got permission to build a railroad between two cities in England, you could go offer scripts on the marketplace in the 1830s. Most of the year, most of the railroad was built ten year, in the 10 years following the collapse, first the bubble and then the collapse. Real business depends on real utility, not on Wall Street, what Wall Street thinks. So let's try and ignore it. Um, I will quickly go through our renewable portfolio. And I want to make the point that it's not about clean tech. This may be people's view of clean tech. I think it's irrelevant. What matters in the areas we are investing in is main tech. It's the infrastructure of society. How can we get an 80% reduction in carbon emissions from this planet if we address 5% or 10% of worldwide electricity or transportation? This is about main tech. It's about scalable. It's about cost. It's about capital formation. It's about all these things. We think of ourselves as having four different areas. We call it the war on coal. War on efficiency, both electrical and mechanical efficiency, and the war on oil, and of course, new materials. Water being among the most important of the new materials. I won't go through the individual companies we've invested in. There's a portfolio of about 50. But I will give you a very quick sense of how it affects your life. Cement for your houses, your foundations, and your buildings. Living Homes is f designing new ways to build buildings. First Leeds Platinum Home built in the United States as a prefab. It was so neat, number two house was bought, purchased by Wired Magazine. Prefab doesn't have to be poor design. In fact, you can afford to use the best design designers if you're going to replicate it. It's just that nobody has cared. Solodyne is doing electrochromic windows, windows that can turn dark or light depending upon whether you want to have more solar heat inside or outside, whether you want more light or less light. Of course, all the fuels to power your car, fuels from renewable sources, and of course, uh, more efficient cars. Outdoor lighting, electricity, 
gas you use, the natural gas, LED lights, your television can be a lot more efficient. In fact, California has just instituted some, reg proposed some regulation along those lines. The water desalination, the plastics under your kitchen sink should all be bioplastics, biochemicals. The nylon in your carpet can be 100% renewable. The air conditioner has not been reinvented for 75 years. Can we come up with something more than an energy hog compressor? We're experimenting with air conditioners that don't have compressors. Every aspect of our life will change. I hope I've convinced you that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. My forecast is new, cheaper than fossil technologies proven in the next five years, six years. The question I ask is how, how will oil compete? Not whether we can compete with oil. I'm fairly certain the price of oil in 2030 will be below $30 a barrel. I'll go on the record to say that. It is, in fact, a great opportunity, but we do need to get to work. Thank you all very much. Any questions? Uh, can you, uh, or I'll repeat it. Yeah, where do we go and learn more about these things? Do you want to get interested? Um, the question is, where do we go to learn more about these things if we want to um, do that? Frankly, I have found the level of information to be abysmal. I do almost all my own research, all my own analysis, because either there's the environmental to do everything, or the skeptical nothing can ever happen, no change can happen, no heavier than air flying machines are possible approach. And so uh, I do have a lot of papers on my website. I publish them, and you're welcome to share them. But there are very few places for reliable data. Yeah, so um, there's this argument out there that as you make a process more efficient, you end up driving demand because you make it cheaper and so and you end up having, uh, making it more affordable for more people. And, and I wonder if we will see the same process um, happen with fossil fuels. In a sense, this kind yep. of technologies are going to drive the price down and make it more useful and so in, in, in the end, increasing more yeah, demand. Yeah, so the, 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 this is a really important question. You know, most environmentalists are in the camp that we need to use less energy. And in fact, Larry, Larry Page likes to say this, we need a lot more energy, we just need it to be low carbon. And I agree with Larry. Absolutely, with green alternatives are a lot less cost over time, and we adjusted the beginning of the cost reduction curve. With oil and coal, we've, we're at, we've leveled out, maybe even increasing. But we had the beginning of the technology cost reduction curve, and so prices will get cheaper, they will get cheaper than fossil, and demand will go up. In fact, uh, today, we consume maybe 10 times the energy per capita that India does. And I suspect we won't consume less electricity, it'll be lower carbon. Now, people in India will catch up to us. Most people would hate the thought that that would happen because the world would be a disaster. The world would only be a disaster if we have to do it the traditional way. Yes. Great, great talk, thanks. Um, I, I guess I see a lot of emphasis on you know, technology, on making cars more efficient and so forth, but what about kind of stepping up and stepping away from that problem and looking to solutions like changing land use regulation and emphasizing mass, you know, mass transit? Because it seems like, well, we can get an efficient car, but you know, we're still gonna have to have suburbs and uh, so forth. Yeah, so God is in the details. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, California, in fact, today is voting on the low carbon fuel standard. I don't want to go too much into it, I've been too involved. But I've been pushing very hard, and I don't think it'll come, this way, come out this way, to make sure that countries can't export biofuels if they don't meet deforestation targets. So making biofuels the tool to ban deforestation 
If Brazil can't export biofuels, if they don't meet deforestation reduction targets, then they will reduce deforestation. It will change what Malaysia and Indonesia are doing. We should use it as a proactive tool. I've also said we should be doing the agricultural practices, and there's a paper on my website. I'm not an agronomist, but I did give a three-hour talk on agronomy at the USDA last year. I'm happy to talk about anything I don't know about. Um, but for example, the right kinds of crop rotations, especially what I call long rotation in my papers, can increase carbon sequestration in the soils and restore soils that no longer can be used for food production back into a healthy food production capable soils. That is possible. I'm not saying it's a certainty because the science has to be done, but there's very plausible ways to do that. I talked about carbon negative cement. With that, there's no reason cities can't be greener than the forest because they're sequestering carbon every time you do. You would no longer build a road out of asphalt, you'd build it out of concrete. And you wouldn't make it nine inches deep and have to maintain it every three years, you'd make it 48 inches deep. What if every road in the world was made 48, uh, uh, four feet deep and carbon negative? Uh, so, yes, it's a, compl a lot, lots of God in the details, lots of details that have to be worked out but I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm fundamentally a technology optimist. I do think uh, these problems will be solved, and politics will slow us down, but it won't stop us. Yeah. Real quick, we got time for probably like one more question because we're kind of running over a little bit and running out of Okay. Um, one black swan idea I've seen is autonomous cars, cars that drive themselves, which have, have basically been built now, um, and how that will affect things because we then won't need to park them ourselves. They can go and park themselves somewhere else and replace transit and stuff like that. Is that stuff you've looked at? Um, you know, I haven't thought about it. I'm, I suspect uh, technology will keep improving. Cars park themselves today, so you, they can uh, do that. Um, maybe they'll drive themselves to the, at some point. I don't know if I'd say it's a high order bit in climate change. Thank you all very much.